Natalie started her studies in, in the Jerusalem University, but she quickly moved here to Weizmann, where she did her uh, second, third degree and a, and a postdoc. So she was uh, initially working in, in uh, condensed matter physics with uh, Udi Merav and, and uh, Israel Bar Yosef, quantum Hall effect. And she did her PhD on that. And then uh, she wised up, uh, decided to move to biology, more <laughs> biological systems. Uh, and she did a short postdoc here with, with uh, Benny Geiger and, and uh, Sasha Bershatsky. And apparently she did it because of, of uh, family constraints that she did this postdoc here. But it, it was a very successful uh, short postdoc and uh, she did some very influential works on, on, uh, on single cells and the forces that, that they exert. Uh, then she moved to a longer postdoc in the US with uh, Stan Leibler in, Prince, in Princeton and then in uh, Rockefeller, where she continued to look at, at cells, but now more on, uh, on decisions that cells take and, 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 and uh, populations of cells and how they survive together. And, uh, and since then, she'd returned to, to the physics uh, department in, in Jerusalem, uh, continuing to look at that uh, single cells, many, many aspects of them. And uh, she'll tell us uh, about them today, some of these today. So thank you, Natalie, for coming. Yes, thank you for the invitation to, to speak here. It's always a real pleasure to come back and see many familiar faces. Um, so. Uh, yes, in biology, uh, we're trying to get and look at a uh, biological system with the eyes of a physicist. And, uh, and in physics, one of the major uh, uh, direction is when you look at the system to try to understand the main characteristic of the system. What is the characteristic of, uh, of a particle, of, uh, of a metal, and we'll see that. But in biology, Self-replication is clearly at the heart of biology. Now, what do I mean by self-replication? I mean the single cell level, so not the fact that we, s we replicate. This is, of course, interesting, but much too complicated for me. And um, when you look at the single cell level, wh whether in our own cells, you see a cell that divides, it has all the elements required to make another copy of itself. Everything is, has to be in this recursive uh, uh, process here of a cell having all the elements that are there to do the work to make another cell. So whether it's mammalian cells, yeast cells, or bacteria that spend you know, all the life kingdom, this is really a central process. And from this process, actually, all biology derives. If you have uh, uh, elements that can self-replicate and take up energy from the environment, very quickly they will compete for this energy and you'll have an evolutionary constraint. So how can we approach this problem? And what do we call understanding? So for some people in the audience, <laughs> This is what we call understanding, maybe. Yes, we know when we look at matter, the matter here that we see at least, we can describe all the particles, all the interaction, and we are done, right? And, uh, and now, in principle, we know what matter consists of. But now, if we move to solid state, right? If we move to a metal, for example, of course, this metal is composed of these elementary particles, but this knowledge doesn't help us say almost anything about the properties of metal. So first, when we look at the metal, we have to define what property we would like to, to understand. And one of, of uh, uh, an important property of, uh, of metal, for example, is uh, the conductance. And then, in order to, to once you have identified the, uh, a component that is really a, an important characteristic of the system, you want to, to develop a completely new formalism to account for for these properties. So this uh, has been, of course, uh, uh, stated by Phil Anderson long ago, that when you move to a different level of complexity, even if you know all the constituents of the system, it doesn't really help you. You need to move to another level of understanding. Now, OK, particles, you will agree with me that this is physics, metals as well. But physics is also able to describe much more complex systems. For example, you can look at an engine. This engine is made of 
metals or some other solids, right? And again, knowing the condensed matter properties of this solid is not going to help you understand what a motor does. And, uh, and uh, of you course... Need the fluid mechanics too. <laughs> Sorry? You need fluid mechanics, not always... <laughs> fluid <laughs> mechanics, okay. <laughs> of course. But the main property of a motor or of an engine is the work it does. It's... it's uh, Maybe it's efficiency that you want to calculate, but for that, Carnot actually introduced new concepts, for example, entropy, although maybe he didn't coin the term. And, and finally, the search for understanding really the heart of the engine led to the whole development of thermodynamics, a completely new branch of physics, in a sense. So now we're trying to move to that, okay? Now, what is a cell? This is a cell, right? the way biologists uh, draw it. The cell is made, of course, of uh, many elements that are physical elements. Actually, the cell is full of motors that do the work that is required, for example, to self-replicate. So motors do the work, pumps do the work in biology. You have all kinds of these elements that are very easy, not easy, but that you can describe with uh, uh, elements of physics if you want to describe each part of the system. but what we are after, and I must, uh, the disclaimer is that I don't think we are there yet. What we are after is really to develop an understanding of one of the main processes in biology, that this cell is able to be at a time point I, one cell, and sometimes later, at a different time point, you have two identical scope, two copies of, of, of this cell. And what is, uh, 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 and what we want to do is really not go into all the details of these cells, but really look at, at the cell as a black box and understand the basic uh, properties that this black box has to fulfill in order to, to self-replicate itself. So I'm going to focus on one main parameter here in this self-replication, which is the time it takes from the birth of one cell to its uh, to its self-replication. So this time is uh, what is going to be the focus of, uh, of this talk. Uh, one uh, uh, work in uh, mammalian cells and one work in, uh, in bacteria. And this is going to be uh, more or less uh, hope to, to have time to describe the two. So what, how can we approach this problem? So uh, one way to do it uh, experimentally is, OK, it's true that we the complexity of what's going on in the biological level inside these black boxes is huge. You can read tons of uh, these uh, textbooks and still you won't get a, a good understanding. So if we don't want to look at the inside of this black box, what can we do? What is nice about biology is that, okay, you have black boxes, but this black box self-replicates, right? It's not, uh, it's like uh, <coughs> if you had a transistor, you made, uh, you know, the ultimate transistor by here in the side micron center, but now imagine that this transistor, optimal transistor, now can self-replicate, right? It's, it's, it's very useful. And here, when you have a cell that self-replicate, sometimes later you have millions of cells of identical black boxes. And therefore, you can now try to at least measure the statistical properties of this ensemble of black boxes and try to... to, to uh, to see whether the, the, the statistical properties of this ensemble of black boxes still give you some insight of what is going on there and on the process of self-replication in particular. So what we're going to do is just to measure the distribution of these times over many, many single cells, okay? So experimentally, we, we, this, these are lymphocytes. They are genetically identical, so same DNA, okay? We're not talking about here mutation for the moment. Same DNA, same environmental conditions. And we just look at them uh, so, uh, dividing. Give them enough food and they divide, divide again and divide again. And of course, we, we do movies like that on thousands and thousands of cells and collect this data. And our question is, what do we expect uh, to get? So of course, noise in biology is everywhere especially at the single cell level. Cells are bags of fluid and motors and things that interact uh, with each other. 
So for example, the most trivial noise that uh, is always there is a partition noise. So it's like a Poissonian noise. You have a cell that, have, uh, that has some discrete components. And at the single cell level, it's everything is at low, I mean, many things are at very low number. So you have discrete components. These discrete components now have to be split into two. It's never, I mean, it's rarely very precise. So at least you'll have Poissonian noise at each division. And therefore, after many divisions, you'll have a distribution of cells with different concentrations of this component, right? You have also everything is all the interaction within the cells of these elements are driven by diffusion and by probabilistic binding and nine binding events. So this all also uh, is a noise source. And there is a lot of work in characterizing these noise sources, uh, both at the experimental and theoretical level. So when you ask people what would they expect the cell cycle to be, the variability in the cell cycle to be, they, they'll tell you that the cell cycle integrates so many of these processes. They are all very noisy and the, the noise adds up. So it's not going to be very precise and you're going to expect some distribution for this time that we measure. The time it takes, for example, for, for this cell here, here in this movie, so this cell has just divided the time it takes it to divide again. Okay, so the colors are fluorescent markers that we've put in those cells that tell us some more details about the progression of the cell cycle, okay? So I don't want to go into it uh, too much, but you can see that for those who are interested, the cell cycle has certain stages. For example, the DNA has to replicate and then the whole cell has to replicate and, 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 and these stages, see a cell is first when it divides, it's black, then it's red, then it's green, then when it's, going to, when it's dividing, it's turning black again and red again, and you can follow not only the total division time, which I'm going to focus about, but also a finer structure of the division process. So, but if we look just at the, the whole cell cycle duration and collect data for many cells, what we see is a distribution which is uh, slightly uh, right-tailed, not a very surprising distribution, I would say, but the variance here, or, or if we characterize it, the, the width of the distribution by the coefficient of variation, namely the standard deviation divided by the mean, this coefficient of variation is uh, of or the order of 20%. So that's relatively wide. It means that the cell can be dividing in uh, over 10 hours, in 10 hours, and, and within the same population, you have a high probability of finding a cell which divides twice slower or even three times slower, okay? So, and here, I don't know if you see it, but what is nice about these cells, and this is why we chose them, is that they are, they are, they are a big ball. This, this ball grows and then suddenly divides into two, right? So you can easily see that the division process is very sharp. There is no uncertainty <coughs> almost on when the division process occurred and the total cell cycle is almost a day. So the precision of the measurement of the total cell cycle duration is of order of 1%, right? It's one of the most precise measurement that we can do on single cells and, and, and it's clearly much below the, the, the coefficient of variation that we see here. So we were a bit puzzled to see such a big variation. Of course, we are not the first one and, uh, and uh, and actually, people would tell you, in, and many models of the cell cycle have been uh, devised, and they all take into account that there is a huge noise in all these uh, processes, and therefore you have this variance. Okay, the, the cell sits there for a while doing nothing, and then it starts growing, and then it splits. Exactly. So there are two times. Yes, there, there, are, there are actually you know, four stages like that. How for the, cell. the whole cell cycle in those cells takes about 15 hours on average. From the, from the point it was born okay. until it gives birth to two but new it cells. Sit doing nothing at not, not for, for a long time. Then no, it no, no. Actually, if you, if you look, it, it grows most of, I mean, these cells, I mean, it really depends on the type of cell, but these cells are, are, are starting to grow quite, uh, quite immediately, quite continuously. Cells 
Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can synchronize them. Okay. Here it's 25 percent. It's if of the of the order of uh, of 20 uh, percent. Yes. So we wanted to look uh, more into why this variance is uh, is so is so large, and then we looked at sister cells. So sister cells are are cells that are born from the same mother cell. Okay. So you have a cell; it divides, and now it has two cells. And now you ask each of the sister cells how long it takes, and if, it's, if the process is so noisy as, uh, as it has been argued, then we should not see a correlation between the sister cells. But we do. We see a high correlation. So this is the time of one sister versus the time uh, that it takes for the other sister to divide. And you see there is a high correlation between the two times. Now, this is also something that is taken into account by many models. And it's very clear because the division is very symmetric. So each cell the sister cell inherit initial conditions from the mother cells that are very similar. Okay, so once they have similar initial condition up to partition effect, then we do expect this initial condition to have some influence on the cell cycle, and this is what we see. So they are in the same place, maybe. They're also in the same place, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. It turns out that it's <coughs> irrelevant. So we look now at mother-daughter correlation. So Somehow noise has to, to accumulate, and the question is if, if, uh, if the initial cell was slow, are its daughter cells going to be also slow, or, uh, or, or are they going to be uncorrelated? And here we see no correlation between the time it, it took the mother cell to divide and the time it took uh, the daughter cells to divide. So no correlation, and this is consistent with this uh, this uh, wide distribution. So if a mother cell is born uh, here in the, in the first part of, uh, of this uh, distribution of division time, then its uh, daughters can be anywhere in this distribution. So yes, the initial conditions do have an influence on the cell cycle duration, but these in initial conditions are uh, randomized somewhere along the mother-daughter uh, bond. <coughs> now we went on because we, we have uh, relatively long movies, and looked at the correlation between cousin cells. Okay, so now cousin cells are related to each other by the tw twice the mother-daughter bond and once the sister bond, okay? So this, this is a relation between uh, cousin cells. And therefore, if you just do mm -hmm. a null model, uh, assuming that this is the only factor that, co that, that can correlate cousins, you can do a partial correlation between these cousins, assuming, taking into account uh, the, the, the factors of their respective uh, sisters. And what, we, what, you, what you get from this uh, partial correlation uh, uh, equation is that what you expect for the cousin correlation, and it's an exact result assuming that they are monotonically uh, correlated, is that the cousin correlation should be the mother-daughter squared times the sister correlation. Okay, so if the mother-daughter correlation is close to zero, the cousin correlation should be even closer. And what we saw mm -hmm. is that the cousin correlation was, very, was still very high, slightly lower than for sister cells, but still very high. So there we were stuck for a couple of years because uh, we thought that maybe it's, uh, it's due to uh, to spatial or temporal effect in, uh, in, 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 in the system. But consistently, we saw that the cousin correlation was higher than the absolute uh, value of the mother daughter correlation, which is in clear violation of the null model. So when we uh, uh, grew cells in microfluidic devices in which they were continuously washed, so we put cells in uh, some uh, grooves and, uh, and then cover them with a membrane, and wash them continuously. So we can see with a dye, for example, that within about five minutes, these grooves are, uh, these uh, uh, pools are continuously washed. So if there are local factors that accumulate, uh, they should be washed out. And still in this device, uh, we, we, we see this uh, inequality, the cousin mother inequality, we call it. So we have uh, uh, actually uh, two, uh, uh, two things that, are, that, are, that we couldn't uh, uh, put together. One 
is the fact that the mother-daughter correlation is zero, and the second is that the cousin correlation is, is high. And, and the question is, okay, the cousin correlation seems to, to say that the inheritance of the cell cycle is actually deterministic. Well, the mother-daughter bond uh, seems to suggest otherwise. And the question is, if we look at the time series, so imagine we take just one branch like that, and we look at the time series of the di first division, second division, third division, so we have a time series of duration. Is this time series deterministic or stochastic, which is, which is uh, the, the right intuition? And more generally, can we distinguish between stochasticity and determinism in, uh, in such uh, time series? So don't have to elaborate on that, but clearly what distinguishes between a deterministic process and a stochastic process in the classical world, right, we are not, uh, is, is, uh, is actually the number of degrees of freedom that control your motion, right? If you have a particle in a box and you know its velocity and position, you can predict where it's going to be at the ne next time step, okay? The number of, parameter of variables that you need to, to know are just a few. Now, if you have uh, a Brownian particle I immersed in water, interacting with a very in a large number of water molecules, it's still collisions that are supposed to be deterministic on some time scales, but effectively, you need to know a huge number of degrees of freedom to predict the motion, and this, this is why you would model this motion as a stochastic motion. So, actually, the distinction between stochasticity and, uh, and determinism is is a quantitative uh, uh, distinction. You want to know if it's one, two, three degrees of freedom, you would call it deterministic, and it's uh, Avogadro number, you would call it uh, stochastic. And the question is, where are our data lies? And uh, discussing mm -hmm. this problem with, uh, with uh, Oded Agam, and you know, when you, you take a problem from biology <coughs> and put it uh, in terms uh, of physics, you say, okay, you have a particle, and these particles, uh, you, you look at it at the discrete times. Is this particle controlled by stochasticity or determinism? So that again said, yes, of course, there are algorithms that were developed to ask exactly this question for physical system. And one of the most famous algorithm is called the grasberger pocaccia algorithm, which has developed here. Uh, and, uh, and it allows you quite simply to, dis to distinguish uh, between uh, two time series, whether they are deterministic or stochastic, by measuring the numbers of degrees of freedom that control these time series, okay? So here there are two time series. One of them is a random number generator of MATLAB, and the other one is a very simple deterministic process. If we just look at them, and you, even if we do Fourier transform, it doesn't really help you. But, so this, this one is a, random number, and this one is a logistic map. So the next time point is just the, f the, the previous one, uh, uh, xn times xn minus one, by one minus xn, and you can multiply it by, let's say, uh, 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 four. And if you apply the, the, this algorithm to this time series, basically what you do is that you replot your data in what is called the correlation space. So the correlation space means you plot xn plus 1 is function of xn. So what you will you see here if you plot xn plus 1 as function of xn? You'll see a parabola, an inverse parabola, which is just this deterministic relationship. And if you plot the random uh, uh, data in this correlation space, you'll get you just fill up the space, okay? So of course, when the dimension is 1, this, you don't need to do much more. It's, it's, it's easy. But what you can do in order to test that this data is really uh, a random and not uh, determinist, you can now go to a higher dimension, plot the data as function of xn plus 1, xn plus 2, and xn. The logistic map will still, the data here will still uh, lie on the one-dimensional manifold. And the, the random data will just fill up now the whole three-dimensional space. And random data is characterized by the fact that if you go on extending the dimension of this embedded space and calculating precisely the dimensionality of your manifold, it will always, this dimensionality will grow with the dimension of the embedded space. So this is a procedure. You plot your data in this correlation space, you increase the number of the embedding space, and when you see saturation, it, it tells you that this is the dimension of your data, okay? so. For the logistic map, for example, if you do that, you see saturation already at one, and for random data, it will 
continue to grow with the dimensionality of the system. So this is what we do, and uh, if uh, the dimension is higher than 10, uh, we consider it uh, above the detection limit of, uh, of determinism. So going back to our data, we have, a ti we have time series, and we are going to calculate the dimension, the correlation dimension, namely the number of effective uh, parameters that govern our data. So if for the logistic map, it's found to be one, and for the random data, it's more than 10. For the cell cycle duration, we find the number that is between two and three, but of course, uh, we don't have the resolution to say any more uh, beyond that, but we do find a signature of a low dimensionality, which is consistent with the fact that the cousin, cousin correlations are high. So we pick one, we, we, we pick, actually, okay, so the procedure is a, a little bit more tricky, maybe I'll come back uh, to it at, at the end, but we collect actually many lineages in, in parallel and, and, and truncate them and, and, and do the correlation dimension on this truncate set. So then you can, you can choose randomly several data sets and each time recalculate the dimension and give you the error bar on your dimensionality. So it's between two and three. You can spell out the function, and the question is, what is this function? Okay. Now, for us, really, the the main point was to put together these two uh, seemingly uh, uh, paradoxical observations: the cousins and, and the mother daughter. And before we we realize that actually we need some nonlinear dynamics here to to explain the system. Uh, we, we tried all kinds of models and models that are in the literature to explain the cell cycle duration. We never saw, saw that. But once you understand that all you need is to violate the null model is actually a non-monotonic, uh, non-linear cell, we took uh, uh, something that was biologically plausible, which is actually a model that is very well known in chaotic dynamic, which is actually two-coupled oscillator. So the cell cycle is an oscillator. Right, it goes back, it progresses in time, and then goes back to, to its, uh, its initial point. And the time of this oscillator, the period of the oscillator is the cell cycle duration that we measure. This is our output. And all we need to assume is that there is another oscillator weakly coupled to this one. And what we took as this uh, biologically plausible oscillator is uh, the biological clock, the circadian clock, the one responsible for our jet lag when we come back from the US. So we know that the circadian clock, namely the fact that there is a day and night a period on the Earth is influencing biological system. It turns out that it can influence single biological system and each cell has an oscillator that measures time, in fact. But these oscillators are not synchronized when they are under our microscope. They are synchronized only in the body, okay? So each cell is an autonomous oscillator that is coupled to, 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 to this uh, circadian clock. And if we just uh, assume that this coupling is now going, the, 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 the day is going to make, for example, the duration of the cell cycle slightly longer and the night slightly slower, and you just assume this sinusoidal coupling, you can write down a model that uh, predicts the time of the daughter cell given the time of the mother cell and the phase of this oscillator that is a circadian clock. And now when you run this model, suddenly it gives you all the, the observation that we have, namely the high sister uh, uh, correlation, the fact that the cousin correlation is always higher than the mother daughter correlation. And another thing that we see when we screen the literature is that the mother daughter correlation it's close to zero, but not always. And in certain system, it was seen to be negative. In other, it was seen to be positive. And in fact, in this model, whether you get mother-daughter correlation negative or po positive depends on the commensurability between these two oscillators. So just by varying a little bit the mean cell cycle duration, you can go from a system that is, has zero correlation between mother and daughter to high correlation between mother and daughter, but if, if you're not at a fixed point, the cousin correlation will always, always be higher than the uh, 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 mother-daughter correlation. So we can, uh, we can simulate this system and, 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 and recreate this absence of correlation between mother and daughter despite 
the, uh, the, the parallel correlation uh, between cousins. And you can take, uh, uh, s uh, for, for some range of parameters of the model, you always get that the cousin correlation is higher than the mother-daughter correlation, to leave uh, its absolute value. And for uh, experiment that we, we run, it is, it, is, uh, it is similar, this main observation. So, you don't the cousins will be fully right. Now, that's a very good point. So, as you see, this is actually not very different from the standard map. It turns out that uh, you, we, we just have another parameter here. If this parameter is one, it is a standard map. Uh, but you're right. If, the, if the, the daughters are completely deterministically defined by this phase, which is the same for both sisters, and by the, the division time of the mother, there should be a, a, a full correlation, so we need another term here. Just for illustrative purposes, uh, in, the first, uh, in, in, in the first publication, we took this term to be also a deterministic map, just to prove the point that you can get this uh, ma cousin mother inequality just by having fully deterministic model, but uh, in, in, uh, in, in the de facto, you need uh, a noise term here, but this noise term has to be smaller than the coupling to the circadian clock. Okay? <coughs> Okay, so um, so uh, the, the the model reproduces uh, uh, quite nicely what we see. Now, measuring it directly, measuring the phase, if we could measure the phase of the circadian clock in our f in our cells, of course, it would be it would be very nice. But uh, this is extremely extremely tricky. It turns out to be. Uh, so we went back and looked for other ways to directly see uh, uh, this, uh, this coupling. And it turns out that uh, actually this model is quite similar to what was proposed for a bacteria that lives in the outside, a cyanobacteria. And this cyanobacteria has exactly, uh, 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 lives outside, so it's very important for this uh, bacteria to know when to divide, whether it's during the day or during the night, because uh, of the UV radiation, this is what has been uh, has been told. So, so this bacterium is known to measure very precisely I mean, the, the the circadian clock uh, uh, and have a phase that, that can be measured. So we took data from a group that measured the single cell duration of this bacterium, as well as a phase of the of the oscillator. And uh, what we saw in this uh, data is that the uh, correlation between cousins was extremely high, okay, maybe the highest uh, that we, we could measure. Uh, co concurrent with that, that the mother-daughter correlation were not significant, uh, slightly negative but not significant, and the sister correlation were, were very high. And I still don't, don't have it here, but in this data we also see the oscillatory behavior that we expect for the coupling. So uh, uh, just to wrap up uh, the, the first part of, uh, of the talk, so this is a general way to look at data that comes out of lineages of cells. You don't really have to measure the, the duration of the cell cycle. You can measure anything just by looking at, uh, at, at this uh, cousin-mother inequality. You can see a signature of a deterministic process in, your, in, in the data and be able to to distinguish between, uh, between uh, noise uh, and, and stochasticity contribution to the variance of, uh, of, uh, of the observed observe, uh, data. So of course in the future we'd like to have a, a, a more, this is really a phenomenological observation both in the data and the simulation, but we'd like to have a, a mathematical understanding from uh, how, how, how well it is, uh, it is, uh, it is preserved, this, uh, this inequality and what does it tell us. Of course, we'd look to look for uh, deterministic uh, signature in other observables and other system. In principle, if you, if you don't know, even if you have a coupling, for example, between an oscillator and your cell cycle, just by measuring this relation, you can have a hint of whether such a, such a mechanism is there. And finally, we'd like to understand the evolutionary relevance of uh, deterministic viability in the cell cycle and in more generally of viability in the cell cycle. So nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution and this is 
as I said in the beginning, uh, clear consequences of self-replication. If you have a system that generates variability in the cell cycle and the system that doesn't generate variability in the cell cycle, which one is going to win at the end in an evolutionary process? So, uh, the food concentration has a difference on this? Yes, of course. So the mean, if, if we look, if we look at uh, the model, uh, where, where it's, uh, it's well defined. So in the model, there are the mean, the, there is a mean cell cycle duration. So this is this line here. So the mean cell cycle duration, of course, is, is defined by how much food you have, what is the temperature. It, it's clearly defined by external factor. But the question is, when you keep these parameters constant, if T0 is, is constant, why do you still get a wide viability in the cell cycle of cells, right? But isn't it, isn't it when you measure it, the food concentration goes down? No, no, because for example, so, so first we measure it in a very dilute uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 system under microscope, and in the microfluidics we wash them every minute, the whole medium is replenished. So, and the divide, it takes them uh, 15 hours to divide, so uh, actually they, have, they, they see a, a food concentration that is uh, constant all the time. This can be also measured, for example, by the fluorescent intensity of the marker that we have. So we, we can see that the conditions stay constant. Uh, and and when actually, when they don't stay constant, you know, every, everyone who has worked with mammalian cells know that sometimes, you know, for some unknown reason, uh, you, have, uh, you have a bad batch of food or things like that, and, 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 and your Nurit is uh, smiling. Uh, so, and, and your, your experiment is a little bit messed up, and you see that cells are starting not to behave very well. In this condition, the cousin mother inequality is lost, okay? So you need constant conditions. Isn't the two times are comparable, the diffusion time and the filtration time? And the effect is there because of that. And if, if it was, uh, if the ratio was very large... Okay, of course, if, if, it, if the ratio is, was very large, for example, in the limit of the of a fast oscillation and you average it out and it's very long, yes. So, so but is this a coincidence? <coughs> is there, is there some That's a very good question. You know, our cells can divide much faster than that, okay? And in many organisms, you see that uh, cells can divide much faster, but uh, the cyanobacteria, for example, has also a division time which is comparable to once a day, right? It's a bacterium. It could divide much faster and if you could give it them, um, so, is it, is it tuned to be by evolution, yeah. to be close to the circadian? Uh, yes, probably. The problem with evolutionary, uh, um, with evolutionary arguments, and this takes me back to, to the next uh, thing, is, is that you always, uh, you always tofer, uh, tofrimidze, you always uh, sue it bediavad, uh, 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 okay, after, uh, after you, you, you see the observation and evolution. what? Yes, and it's evolution. And, and, the qu and the question is, can really evolution change this distribution of cell cycle duration? Is it really something that we can answer? Yes? Okay, I was asked whether if we work with uh, uh, Cancerous uh, cells, it skips, so these are cancerous cells. Of course, you need the cells that can go on uh, replicated, but, but uh, yes. Yeah. Can you tune, can you try to tune the circadian clock by changing the light, the light and dark cycle? So, so it would be nice, but uh, the, these cells probably do not have light receptors. Okay, so you, you cannot really change. In cyanobacteria, you can do all these games, and we may be moving now to, to continue the work on cyanobacteria, yes. <coughs> so, th so, so the next question is, you know, we, s we saw a mechanism that really controls uh, deterministically the variance of, uh, of cell cell calculation, but more generally, whether you control it by uh, increasing the noise or whether you control it deterministically, can an evolutionary process really affect the, cells, the, the distribution of cell cycle duration and not, not only its mean. Of course, the mean of cell cycle duration has been probably tuned by evolution to be whatever it is, but here the question is, can, can we tune also the variance? Now, how do you answer such a question? 
without uh, hand waving arguments. So there we, we, we turn back to, to bacteria and just perform an evolutionary experiment under our eyes. Okay? So what we, we did was to take a population that has a narrow distribution of division time and expose it to cycles of stress and, and reg regular growth. So of course, if you are in, in, in very good conditions, you want to grow as fast as possible, right? There is no point in, 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 have in, 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 uh, in not uh, being at the optimal uh, uh, growth rate. But if you encounter stress, there are several uh, theoretical works that has, have, uh, have uh, predicted that you would like to diversify. You would like to spread your bets. It's called bet hedging to diversify and have cells with different uh, properties. And the cell cycle is a crucial property because all cells are going to be much more uh, uh, affected by any stress uh, if they are uh, actively dividing, whether they are slow dividing. So we, we did this protocol, and uh, after some time we saw that the Wolf strain was actually surviving the stress, and the stress here, I forgot to say, it's an antibiotic treatment, that's the easiest stress to put on uh, bacteria, an antibiotic treatment of several hours, then you wash the bacteria regrow, and you do it for several cycles. And uh, of course, if you look, uh, in the literature, what people expect to occur is a mutation, right? You expect a mutation that turns bacteria into resistant. And these mutations are detected by this assay. You put antibiotics here, it diffuses, and then there is a region, I don't know if you see it, there is a region around the disk where bacteria cannot grow, but they grow all around here, okay? And the radius of this region of inhibition tells you how sensitive the bacteria is to the antibiotics that was put in the disk. So this is a totally resistant strain. It can grow up to the disc here. It grows all over the place. And therefore, it's not affected by the antibiotics. So uh, uh, of course, you can quantify this. And there is a number that tells you how much antibiotic you need to put on a bacterium in order to, make, to, make, uh, to, to, to stop its growth. And this is what is measured every time you go to the hospital and you have an infection. They will measure the MIC of your uh, bacteria to the antibiotics that they give you. So what we see is, uh, yes, the bacteria do not die, they've evolved, but their MIC, which is a diameter <coughs> of this uh, region where there is no growth, is actually not smaller in the evolved strain than the original strain, it's even slightly larger. So what happens, and how much time do I have? 15, 20 minutes. 15, okay. Sorry, Right? Okay, so, so we, we see there is no difference in the sensitivity to the antibiotics, so they survive not by adapting to the antibiotic uh, duration. And when we look at single cells, so these are single bacteria growing under the microscope, and we measure the time it takes for, for, for each of these bacteria to start dividing again, we see that in the ancestral strain this happens quickly, and in the evolved strain this happens on a much longer time scale. Okay? So if we measure quantitatively these times and we accumulate, we measure again the distribution uh, to, uh, uh, to, to divide when exposed to the antibiotic treatment. So here you see the ancestral strain, which has a narrow distribution at short times. And this is a vol strain, which has a much wider distribution. Right? It's very different. And also the mean of the distribution has changed. And uh, what, what we could see, and this is uh, the, is, uh, the nice system about, about E. coli, if you, if you take, you can sequence the strain. Here it's an evolutionary step. The evolutionary step, the mutation that made this uh, strain have such a wide distribution of, of this uh, division time is actually a single mutation. You can track it, and you can reconstruct it in the ancestral strain, or you can take it away. So here I think it's the one that is taken, you, you, can recon you can correct the mutation in the, in the evolved strain and see that it goes back to the original strain. So you know very precisely what DNA change has made the distribution of uh, division time here go from this distribution to that. 
Okay, and it's a single mutation in most cases. Now, when we looked at the mean uh, uh, time here to first division, and it's not, it's, it's the time it takes when you dilute the bacteria into fresh medium until, until they, they, they do their first division. So when we look at this mean time, it was obvious to us that this mean time was very close to the duration of the antibiotic treatment. Okay, so what happens here is that the bacteria, when they are diluted into fresh medium, instead of immediately growing, for three hours, they just sit there. Instead of immediately growing like that. And, the, and these three hours is exactly the duration of the antibiotic treatment. Now, when they just sit there and don't divide, they are less sensitive to the, to the antibiotic and therefore they survive. They're not resistant, they cannot grow in the presence of antibiotic. They just sit down and wait for the antibiotic to, to go away. So in this evolutionary experiment, the bacteria have adapted to the fact that when they are exposed to fresh medium and they are supposed to start growing again, this fresh medium is always full with antibiotics, so let's not do that. Let's wait three hours and wake up only on average three hours later, okay? So no, they don't sense the antibiotics. So this, for example, this distribution here is measured in the absence of antibiotics. You just take the bacteria, you put them, now just fresh nutrient, no antibiotics anymore, but they are pre-programmed not to grow for an approximate time of three hours, okay? If you give antibiotics for five hours, so there's a big mutation for five hours? Excellent <laughs> question. So of course, when we saw that, we repeated this experiment in parallel lines, so not just the one, so, so several culture. Three hours of antibiotic, daily antibiotic treatment, five hours of daily antibiotic treatment, or eight hours of daily <coughs> antibiotic treatment, okay? And what we found in each time is within 10 cycles, so only 10 times you do that, right? And you have uh, this mutation uh, in your population that makes the, the bacteria not respond to the antibiotic anymore. Resistant is not there yet, okay? So it's not the main problem that people talk about. They are, they are doing it much faster than you would expect uh, resistance to occur. And, uh, um, and when you measure the distribution of uh, division time, so this is ancestral, right? Then you can see that the, the, the strain that was on the three hours of antibiotic treatment has, uh, has a broader distribution, but also the, the mean has shifted. Five hours also is broader, and eight hours it's much broader. <coughs> and when, uh, and when you, you, you look at uh, the, the median of this distribution, they, 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 they follow quite well the duration of the treatment. So three hours, I, I think uh, I have the plot uh, slightly later. Now, this, uh, uh, this uh, strategy of uh, just uh, going to sleep for a few hours and changing your cell cycle uh, time distribution is actually quite useful because now if you switch the antibiotic, if during this duration, instead of giving them the antibiotic that was uh, evo where they evolved, so one is a penicillin, the other one is a totally different antibiotic, <coughs> then they are also uh, protected against the other antibiotic but because it's also an antibiotic that need active growth to kill the bacteria. So if you go, if, if you have an infection and the infection becomes tolerant, this is not resistant because of this, uh, uh, th this uh, uh, effect and the doctor changes your antibiotics, it may not, not help. So from the evolutionary process, actually the, the, uh, the understanding why it happens is, is very simple. You have two possibilities, uh, either you grow G or you, you, you are in, the, in this lag period where you don't grow and you have a switching rate between, uh, between these two uh, the possibilities. And the question is, what is the optimum lag time that you need as function of the duration of the antibiotic treatment? And if you assume that the lag time are exponentially distributed, so you have just one parameter, which is both the mean and, and, and the standard deviation, what you expect from, a, from this model is this, uh, is, is this straight line, which, which is not totally linear at small time, but which is uh, linear here, uh, of the lag time, the mean lag time that you expect versus antibiotic duration exposure. So this is a strain 
exposed to three hours of antibiotics, and this is um, the mean lifetime that it had. Five hours of antibiotics, and eight hours is slightly higher. So the mean lifetime for the eight hours antibiotic exposure turns out to be uh, almost 10 hours. Yes? So does this mean that, that the way we take anti antibiotics when we treat our own infection should change to being more drastic? Uh, okay, that's a good question. The thing is that if, uh, if you look at this model here, right, it assumes that the lifetime distribution is exponential. So when the mean changes, also the standard deviation changes, and, 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 and actually is very broad. So this mechanism actually is not the true optimum, right? Intuitively, we understand that if we now relax the, uh, the, the distribution of lifetime and we allow the lag, the mean and the variance to be different, the optimal strategy for bacteria would be just for the whole population to wait for the antibiotic duration to end and then to start growing up. So in fact, if you were looking for the true optimum, this is what they should have done, right? But this is not what they did, right? The first way to adapt is, is, is not by a very precise adaptation to this time scale, but to, uh, on the contrary, to move both this time scale, but also to spread your, your bets on different time scales. So now, if you don't give precisely every three hours, I mean, three hours a day, but you give three and 0.5 hours a day, or even five hours still, this strategy is going to be, uh, to, to, to be there. And therefore, it's not going to be a big difference if you do this stochastically or not, okay? So we, we need to be smarter, but. Maybe it's not the main mechanism for resistance. They, they, they really are resistant. Antibiotics, the ones that are resistant. It's not the strict that you use. Right. That's an important point, right? We, we, you, you never heard about this trick, right, in the clinic. And what we do when we take a pill every day, and there are many antibiotics now that, that are just take a pill every day or, or two a day, and the antibiotic in your body is doing exactly that. It shoots up, and then it's washed away, and then bacteria can regrow until the next, uh, the next pill. So why, why didn't we hear about this effect, right? So the first answer is that if your immune system is, is, is active, the fact that bacteria stay there and do not grow is not harmful for you because your immune system is going to get rid of them. What is harmful in bacteria is that when they grow exponentially and then there is an arm race between our immune system and, and, and the bacteria. But even if you, for a healthy person, I mean, with someone with a, a good immune system, if you just stop the growth of bacteria, and there are certain antibiotics that do just that, then uh, that, uh, that's enough. So in principle, you know, this should not be a problem, the fact that they delay their, their growth. The thing is that it's becoming more and more clear that for immunocompromised patients, which are closer to the beaker than, uh, than, than, uh, than a normal uh, uh, patient, then it might be a big problem. Okay, and immunized, uh, immunocompromised uh, person, it means HIV person, where, where, where you can see it can be also uh, the elderly population, so it's an increasing problem. And this may be also the first step, because eventually if you go on giving them in antibiotics, they will become resistant. But they were managed, they, they were able to survive this first exposure by having this very quick adaptation. So actually one of, uh, one of the, the, the future goals, uh, we are not going to do it uh, uh, only by ourselves, but, but uh, there are already uh, people really in the clinic that are interested in looking at this phenomenon because what is going on is that in the clinic the only test they do on the strains that are making problems to patient is this test, okay? So if you, have, uh, if you have an infection, this is a test that is going to be done in the clinic. They are going to look at, the, uh, at this region of inhibition, right? They are going to put all kinds of antibiotics and they are going to choose which antibiotic to give according to how wide this region is, okay? So, um, so no one is looking for this tolerance, okay? So whether it's there or not, we don't know. So one of the future direction is, uh, is uh, to develop a quantitative tools so that people would be able to, to look for it because it, we do the evolution experiment in the lab, but of course there is a huge evolution experiment going on 
in the clinic everywhere and would like to, to have quantitative data on what is going on there. So this is uh, uh, one uh, future direction. Uh, I didn't get uh, at all into the identification of the mutation that are responsible for tolerance, but this is also a signature. We can look for mutation, the mutation that we found in these strains and look whether it's there in the clinic too. And, uh, and um, uh, finally, it looks as if self-replication can really be tuned uh, by external condition, not only the mean, but, uh, but also the, the whole distribution. And thank you for, for your attention. <laughs> Most importantly, acknowledgement. So the first part, uh, the people that contributed to the first part are uh, in uh, red here. So the, the work on the lymphocyte was done in a collaboration with Itamar Simon at the, at the medical school. It was a great uh, collaborator. Uh, and uh, Odeda Gam for the grasberg Procaccia algorithm implementation. Sivan uh, Pell uh, in, in my lab was really the very courageous PhD student that worked on this lymphocyte project for about six years and uh, until we figured out uh, what uh, was going on there. Um, and um, uh, Ofer Friedman is a, a PhD student that uh, conducted the evolutionary experiment of microorganisms uh, held by Irit uh, Levin and uh, Amir Goldberg. Now, Noam Shoresh at the Brand Institute were also instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in analyzing uh, the data. And we thank uh, funding, an ERC starting grant, and a recent second ERC. Thank you. Yes, so we measuring it at the single cell level is extremely tricky, but measure it uh, on the population level is, uh, is possible. So we measured what is the periodicity of the circadian clock in, uh, in our cells, and it's very close to 24 hours, uh, 25 hours. So they still oscillate with this, o I mean, what, what I do I mean by the, the oscillate? Because the circadian clock is known in our body, we know which genes are following the circadian clock, so you can look at in the population, you can look at how much of this gene is made and follow it over time, and you can see the 24-hour periodicity. So this is what we did for the lymphocytes, so it's 25 hours, but it's, uh, yeah. So it's there, and, and it's not linked to the daylight. The daylight, we need, you know, our eyes and, and all kinds of sensors. Uh, I'm not uh, really expert on where, where, where we have sensors for, for the circadian light, but at the single cell level, it's not it's not believed that there is a, a sensor of light that influences the circadian clock. So maybe, yes, maybe not. So this is exactly what we are, we are starting to look at. As it is now, if you, if you take another model with instead of having exactly this coupling, but another nonlinear model that has these basic properties of, uh, of this cha chaotic behavior or, or quasi periodic behavior, you will be able to, to explain the correlation. So now we are looking really mathematically what class of models will give us other signatures because uh, in, in this data of the lineages that would be specific for, for this model and not for another. But this is ongoing work, and there's, there's very little, you know. Nonlinear dynamics, of course, there is a huge literature on nonlinear dynamics, right, which uh, we had to, to go through. But so we have many, uh, in physics, we have many examples of nonlinear dynamics, but they are always in time series. When did you see a chaotic process that divides symmetrically and grows exponentially? And an anal an an analysis of the, d of, of the statistic of such a process, there is. I mean, we are looking for it. If someone has a, a reference, we'd be glad, but there is no literature on that. And what we do is a Poolsman uh, uh, way of analyzing the data. We measure correlation between generations, and we measure the grasberger pocaccia which is a very fancy tool on a linear, but there is probably ma many more uh, observables that we could extract from the lineage data that we, we don't do yet. <coughs> 